Thank you, Eva, for very kind uh, introduction. Uh, it's, it's a real pleasure uh, to, to be with you in this event, and I hope uh, we can engage in a productive discussion about uh, the ERC. And uh, so the, what, what I'm going to do in my presentation is to go through the general aspects of the evaluation approach of the ERC. And then uh, in the second part, I will uh, pay special attention to some figures uh, relating to our domain, social science and humanities, and talk about uh, uh, specific advice uh, for preparation of uh, proposals. And but as I said, I'm, I'm very much uh, looking forward to interacting uh, with you. Okay, so let me, uh, first of all, the, the, what is the, the ARC about? We, we heard about this uh, this morning. Uh, excellence only, that's a uh, uh, defining trait of the ERC, and, and excellence only is kind of a very old uh, statement, because it's to the exclusion of other considerations that are legit legitimate and are part of other uh, research programs, like uh, targeting uh, some areas uh, preference or to others and uh, targeting uh, specific types of researchers, geographical targeting. But th this is not uh, part of the, 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 the ERC remit. And uh, related to this, traditionally, there has been a focus on individual researchers. The synergy grants are perhaps uh, an exception to that focus. The, and this, 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 this made a difference when ERC started uh, relative to other uh, framework, uh, uh, pro fr fr framework program <coughs> boards. Right? And, and, and partly the, the, the emphasis on individual researchers is a device that allows the ERC uh, to make uh, the excellence only uh, approach feasible because uh, it is much more difficult to establish uh, excellence when it is a diverse group of researchers than when we are uh, comparing individual researchers. And, and then the, the independence. Independence is uh, the other element that uh, sets uh, ERC apart, uh, not only from uh, national agencies, but also even from uh, the NSF in the United States. I mean, the fact that uh, there is a governing body of uh, active scientists uh, that uh, decide on a work program uh, on an annual basis, backed up by an executive agency. This is a uh, uh, um, was no, no well written that this was supposed to happen in Europe and this has been a very bold experiment uh, that uh, so far well, has produced uh, very positive <coughs> results, I think. So let me uh, go through uh, evaluation criteria, excellence and excellence. Uh, there is excellent, uh, two dimensions there. Uh, the research project and the principal investigator. So, uh, definition of excellence, uh, groundbreaking nature and potential impact of the research uh, project. Groundbreaking as opposed to incremental. Um, panels are asked to consider to what extent a proposal addresses important challenges and to what extent the, the objectives are ambitious and go beyond the, the state of the, the art. Of course, there is a subjective element in considering these aspects. I mean, nowhere there is a, 
uh, you know, a definitive line. Here stops incremental, here begins groundbreaking. But uh, panels are asked to think along these lines, and these lines uh, define their, their work uh, for, for in, in the evaluation. And the, we also emphasize uh, high risk, uh, high gain uh, proposals. The project may be successful, in which case there are uh, large payoffs, in, but the project may not be successful. So to some extent, we want, when we look at monitoring and uh, ex post assessment of the evaluation process, we also look for failures. You cannot have high risk, high reform if, uh, if you don't have uh, failures. If we don't have enough failures, it may be that we are not sufficiently uh, considering uh, high risk uh, projects. And uh, maybe the, in our uh, statistics, uh, we don't have uh, enough number of failures. We are uh, doing too well in that uh, respect. Uh, you, can, you can read uh, much more about all this in our uh, work program. So, uh, let, let us uh, look at uh, the, the aspects of uh, the evaluation in a bit uh, more detail. For the research project, I mean the, the, the criteria that I have uh, described are uh, essentially the same uh, for the three basic programs that we run. Starting grants, consolidator grants, and advanced grants. It is not that uh, because it is a starting grant and it should be less groundbreaking than if it's consolidator or an advanced grant. Right? There are no such uh, differences. We also, of course, insist on a scientific approach being pursued in the proposals. And what, what does this mean? Well, if one has to examine uh, the proposal uh, against uh, the standards of the scientific method. To what extent is the approach feasible uh, in reaching the, the potential results that are as hopeful. Uh, to what extent the methodology is uh, suitable for the goals of the project. To what extent there is uh, innovation in the methodologies. Uh, usually uh, methodological innovations and groundbreaking grounds go side by side, but not always, right? So methodological innovation is not a requirement for a groundbreaking proposal. Um, and also time scales, time scales and resources. So in the evaluation of the budgets of the proposals, uh, panels consider side by side the goals, the scientific goals and the means to get those scientific goals. Okay, now so the, the, the principal investigator uh, the excellence aspect also applies to the principal investigator. Uh, panelists uh, evaluate the extent to which the PI has a demonstrated ability to, to do the type of work that is uh, required of her or him. Right? Um, evidence of creative independent thinking, um, achievements, right? But, 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 but remember, and this is, this, this is important, uh, an ERC grant is not a prize for past work, not at all. It's providing resources to people that want to do something, to enable them to do what they want to do that has been assessed to be worth uh, doing according to those criteria, right? So we are not evaluating CVs as panel members when we are in this role as uh, to, you know, to establish uh, distinction per se. 
we are evaluating CVs to establish capabilities for doing what the people want to do. And an important aspect. Yes? Uh, sorry, so just following this point, would you say, what's the percentage rate of your past success, your career record, your project, as compared to your uh, project proposal? Like, how would you weight it? Would that be 50 and 50 percent? Or is there more value of one aspect than the other? Last, uh, last week, I was uh, spent three days in Brussels uh, observing step two interviews in uh, all consolidator panels in our domain. And uh, the discussions there revolve all around the projects. Right? So answering your question, I would say certainly there is no uh, a convex rule. So much uh, uh, project, uh, so much uh, CV. The, 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 the rule is, uh, you know, is, is making sense of the objectives. What are the objectives? To put a lot of money in projects that are worth doing by people that are capable to take them down the road, right? So it's, it's not a mechanical. Um, yeah, thing like this. The commitment is important, and to some extent, this is uh, this is the result of a subjective evaluation. But this this is something that uh, that is often uh, appreciated, uh, not only in the track record of the researcher, but also in the process of the two-step interviews. Independent thinking. Now, when it comes to the advanced grants, the advanced grants are typically applied for by the more established researchers, are a comparatively smaller part of the ERC budget. The big part of the ERC budget uh, goes to starting grants, to the younger end of the research communities. And in the case of the advanced grants, uh, another aspect that is taken into consideration is uh, leadership in the training and advancement of uh, young researchers. There you look for a 10-year uh, track record uh, of uh, research, uh, uh, pushing the frontier, but also this type of leadership. That would be in, in, in in terms of uh, bullet writing, the, the, the only one that we would add when it comes to advanced grants. All the, the other aspects would be in common. So principles of the, the peer review that is conducted there, coherence across all domains and fields. We do not have uh, different rules for the life sciences, for the physical sciences and engineering, or for social sciences and humanities. It's all the same rules. Forward-looking approach, as I said, we are not giving prices for uh, previous distinction. Interdisciplinarity is encouraged, but not enforced by any means. Um, funding allocations are independent of the panel structure, right? You might say, well, how can this be? It may be in the life sciences, uh, the, the resources that are required to conduct a project are very different to the social sciences or the humanities, maybe. Well, if, you look, if we look at, uh, uh, at this from a statistical perspective, we find that uh, it is actually like this, but this would be an exposed statistical analysis of what has uh, come out. At the level of individual projects, uh, different projects may require uh, very different uh, uh, types and levels of resources. And this is, it is up to the panels to evaluate those aspects, right? So again, 
the, the evaluation of the budgets goes side by side with the projects. The panel members are instructed precisely not to distribute monies in any across the board way so that maybe we can have more grants with fewer monies. Uh, panel members can look at the budgets, but, but the way they look at the budgets is, are these the resources that are required for uh, what this uh, researcher wants to do. Are they enough? Are they too much, too little? That's the thing. And this, this thinking, if pursued in the right way, may produce differences exposed across domains, but not exactly. And flexibility and inclusiveness, that's, uh, that's a, 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 an all-pervasive uh, philosophy in everything that uh, the ERC does. So let me uh, move to the, the specific figures for the social sciences and humanities. This is uh, the success rate by gender in the, in the domain. The domain, I will come to this in a moment, is very diverse. And I will tell you uh, what, what, <coughs> what exactly it covers. The, we are very proud that uh, the, the success uh, overall is the same for uh, female and male researchers, 13%. And there are small variations uh, by domain. In the SH domain, the, the female rate of success is a little higher than it is for males. But uh, in the life sciences, it is uh, the opposite. Not so in the physical sciences and engineering. Success rates in the SH domain by country the picture is not that different from what we saw uh, earlier uh, this morning. Uh, if, you, if you want to put some discipline into uh, this chart, uh, there is uh, like a middle group that, uh, that have a success rate uh, between 6 and 8%. And then there are uh, um, two groups that uh, have uh, higher rates of success uh, uh, of the middle and another two groups uh, with lower uh, rates of success uh, below the middle, right? Pollen is uh, not doing very well. Uh, the, this is something that uh, we heard this morning. Let me tell you that uh, one thing that I learned from uh, my visit to this country, the days I've been uh, uh, spending here, is uh, the awareness of this and the determination, the ambition that I've seen among scientists, among uh, government officers, uh, to move away from this situation. You might say, oh, but this is, uh, this is to be taken for granted. Not necessarily. I haven't seen that kind of determination in other places the way I've seen it here. <coughs> and, uh, so the hope is that uh, the initiatives that uh, are being pursued uh, will change uh, this situation. Uh, in after a few years, uh, we'll see very different numbers. I come from a country. Um, I'm, I am from Spain in which, uh, relative to the situation we had a few years ago, we are doing relatively well. You see, we are, uh, uh, Spain is, uh, is down there, right? So we are about 8%. And so you would say, well, we are doing okay. Uh, but but uh, the situation has changed dramatically. In, and, and in, in a very short period of time. And it'd be difficult to uh, do a comprehensive analysis of the importance of the different elements that have played in this change. But, but, but uh, I think the, the, uh, a positive uh, comment here is that change in a small period of time is possible. Yeah. 
Uh, I'll say but, uh, maybe I'll let's wait with questions until sorry. the end of presentation because, because maybe your doubts will be clarified by Professor later. Okay, so let me let me move on. The the idea <coughs> became a comparative uh, uh, three <coughs> central European countries: uh, Hungary, Poland, Czech Republic. Uh, relatively comparable in other dimensions. Hungary and the Czech Republic are doing better. But, uh, the, 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 I'm not sure how much to read uh, from these figures. Yeah. The only question concerning what is successful. Is it per application in yes. the or per from the whole? This, uh, this, this is success rate relative to the number of applications in the country and in the domain. So the, 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 the trend in Poland is positive. Uh, I am partly a statistician, so if we put a confidence band there, the, 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 we have probably too few observations to read too much uh, from these uh, extrapolated trends. But still, better to have uh, these, uh, these, these trends than, than, than others. The, the, is, this, uh, this figure is also interesting. I mean, this is a subset rights in the three domains for all countries. And this, this tells uh, a story, two, 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 two points I would draw from there. There is some volatility that, uh, in success between domains in some countries. For example, you go to uh, Switzerland and Switzerland is doing uh, much better in the life sciences and the physical science than it is doing in the in the in the social science and humanities, right? So th 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 there is volatility. There is also big volatility in Israel, for example. But uh, the the overall aspect here is that uh, uh, success rates tend to go, tend to move together, right? That uh, you are doing well in one domain, you are also doing well in the others. And this suggests that the forces that uh, determine how well you do are not so much a domain specific, but of a more, or a more general nature. Um, scientists in Poland, <coughs> Uh, success rates in the three domains. Let us uh, look at uh, social sciences and humanities. Uh, 242 proposals evaluated, 700 success rate, 3%. These are the absolute numbers we are talking about. This 7 is now 8, by the way. Uh, the 8 is uh, what we got in the in this uh, table, and the, this is uh, in the social sciences, uh, four researchers associated with the University of Warsaw, and four from the Yablonian University in Krakow, and, uh, and uh, oh, three from the Yablonian, and one from Bosnia. Right? So that's, uh, that's the, the situation in the, in the domain. So what is the, the domain uh, about? Uh, up to now, the domain has uh, consisted of uh, six different panels. As our president uh, mentioned earlier in the morning, there is going to be a change now. There is going to be a seventh panel, and the <coughs> SH7. So the, the current structure, SH1, uh, includes uh, economics, and the fields in business economics, management, finance, and SH2, institutions, values, environment, and space. This includes uh, political science, legal studies, and SH3, social world, diversity, population. This includes uh, sociology, demography. So as you see, these are uh, uh, big coverages, very much uh, cross narrow field panels. In fact, uh, the, the new panel will take some of the components of SH2 and SH3 
to become a panel centered around mobility, right? Migration, geography, space, cities, environmental aspects, right? So that's, uh, that's the, the idea. SH4, the human mind and its complexity. This includes uh, psychology, branches of philosophy, cognition. Right? That's also a very diverse panel. SH5, cultures and cultural production, a very diverse panel. You will hear about it uh, from uh, uh, Michal's presentation in a moment. I discovered literature, philology, the arts, architecture, right? And you might say, well, does it make sense uh, to have uh, such uh, broad panels? Well, it does. It does because uh, uh, the, the, our experts, Andre was uh, emphasizing this in his presentation this morning, our experts, in, uh, in step one of the evaluations are the generalists. And sometimes there is more than one aspect to appreciate in the evaluation of a proposal, right? There are sometimes there are uh, uh, prevalent interdisciplinary elements. Other times the elements are more subtle, right? And the, the, it, it, it goes to the heart of the ERC a approach to evaluation that panels to some extent are brought in their coverage. And then SH6, uh, the study of the human past. This is uh, the history panel, history in all its dimensions and archaeology as well. Okay, so I'm not going to uh, take much time in conceptual clouds associated with each of the panels. I will tell you about those. So let me conclude uh, with a few tips and advice uh, for uh, your applications for ERC grants. Uh, be ambitious, be daring. Panels, as I said, are instructed to seek out high-risk research. Don't apply for a ERC grant if you are not driven by something that you want to do. If you are driven by getting a prize, somehow it will show. And this is not what the ERC is about. You've got to be driven. You, want, you need to want the money to do something with it and have a very clear idea of what you want to put that money to, what the use is to put that money, right? And the, I already talked about this, part B1 will be seen by generalists. So it is important that this is a clear statement that is not targeted only to specialists in your field or subfield. It should make sense to broader community of researchers. Step two, reviewers see both B1 and B2, so tend not to repeat, duplicate what you've done in B1 in part B2, right? Familiarize yourself with uh, ERC-funded proposals and don't, de don't do this in isolation. Uh, that this is uh, very important. And it is not only important from the point of view of uh, succeeding. It is also important from the point of view of creating the right culture of application for ERC grant in your own institutions and departments. Sometimes we observe dynamics of self-exclusion. Something that uh, one does in isolation, since the proposals trying that nobody hears, <coughs> and then uh, keep the thing secret if a big grant is not given. That's not the approach. Um, the, the, uh, a grant uh, typically uh, will not be uh, given uh, very often, if, if only because uh, we do not have enough money to give grants to all the deserving applicants. Many grants will be evaluated positively, right? And the, so make this uh, uh, 
part of your research activities. I involve your colleagues, try your presentations with your colleagues, get them feedback, get them as enthusiastic about your project as possible as yourself are. That's a, that's a very important aspect. We've seen that institutions where uh, we have successful grantees have developed this culture, right? That's, uh, um, I've already said that, practiced thoroughly several times. Yeah, panels want to see that these are your ideas, not those of your uh, supervisor. So let me, I heard uh, from some of the presentations earlier this morning, right, that uh, advisors are not uh, forever. In a way, you know, we, we grow up as researchers by challenging our advisors, by looking for our own way, doing our own things. And, and that's, that's an important element. The, the, as I said, uh, the, the starting grants is the predominant element in our budget. And to me, it's, it's also the most important in many ways. One, because, uh, you know, often uh, young researchers in their mid-30s uh, near in 40, do the most important research of their careers, the most creative, the most daring, right? So that's, that's one reason for focusing there. And also, the type of research that young researchers do tends to be different, tend to be more disruptive. And disruptive gets associated with groundbreaking things, right? Science, to some extent, progresses with mutation. People thinking outside the established lines and wanting to do their thing in a different way. Right? And, and, the, and there is another aspect in which we have observed that starting grants are disruptive. Disruptive of the, of the established ways, of the balance of power within institutions and departments. Starting grants, consolidator grants as well, have an empowering effect on the researchers <laughs> within their own institutions and drive institutional change to some extent. This is uh, it's, it's, it's not something that is explicitly intended, but uh, when we observe what has been happening uh, in the past, as a result of ERC grant, we, we, we observe that this is a, a relevant component. Thank you very much.